What's up, everybody? What's up, what's up, what's up? Welcome to Thrive. Hope you're doing fantastic. Uh, hey, you know the vibes. You know the vibes. Drop some fire in the chat right now. Let's just, let's, let's light it up. Let's light it up. It's going to be an incredible night. And I'm looking forward to, man, to, to all that all that's going to be released really quick, really quick, really quick. Just a couple of them um, because I, I want to get into this lesson, man. I want to get right into this lesson. So there are a couple of things I want to share. And um, I think they're incredibly important. I want you to lean in really quickly here. And that's the, so, so here's the first thing, guys. Here's the first thing. If you are not subscribed to this channel, you got to subscribe. This is this is. I'm telling you right now, you got to subscribe. And let me tell you why. We, we've been planning for this for a while, my team and I. But we started this this week where we're literally releasing content on this channel every single day. I think it's Hebrews uh, 3.13, somewhere around there. Uh, it says, encourage each other daily. And I'm like, man, I realize and recognize that we need we need encouragement. We need instruction. We need it every single day. And so I want you to subscribe to this channel if you're not subscribed. And then I want you to also hit that that bell, man, that notification button. That way you can actually get notified every time content is dropped. We just uh, we just released something recently. Uh, and, and they're shorts, you know, they're shorts. All of them aren't long. We just released something recently. And if you haven't seen it, you need to go back and watch it. Now, after you're done watching this, you need to go and watch this. If you haven't watched it, uh, I think the title is Your Disappointment is Not My Responsibility. Listen to me. I'm telling you right now, so many people struggle with assuming responsibility for something that you're not responsible for. You're responsible for whether or not you are offensive. You're not responsible for whether or not someone is offended because whether or not someone is offended is gonna be determined by a lot of factors that may have very little to you. You are responsible for your communication. You are not responsible for someone else's comprehension. Should you try to communicate in a way that they can comprehend? Absolutely. But just like there are communication styles and levels, there are comprehension styles and levels. And with that being the case, man, there are times where you can be as clear as you are attempting to be, as, as, you, as clear as you can be. And there are people who are just determined to misunderstand you. They are just... They, you can say something and then I, this, I'm teaching already. If, if this is adding value to, to you already, just put teach in the chat. If this is adding value to you, uh, just put teach in, in the chat. But th th here's the point, man. The, 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 there are different communication styles, there are different communication levels, and there are some people that are just, you know, they're just, you will say something and then they will interpret it away and then you will tell them what you mean and they will tell you what you meant. You can't tell me what I meant. <laughs> Only I know what I meant. And so sometimes, sometimes we're taking responsibility for something we're not responsible for. So if you haven't checked that one out, I need you to check that one out. And then I also did this one, man, called God and Entrepreneurship. And I run into this all the time. It's like everybody, uh, like the, these principles I'm talking about, like of entrepreneurship, they apply, they apply to leadership, they apply to entrepreneurs, they apply to just people who want to grow. And so anyway, this content, man, we're, we're putting on there every single day, Monday through Friday, at least. And uh, well, Monday through Friday and Sunday. So Sunday through Friday, actually. And um, so I want you to be in the know about that. Well, this is Thrive, and it's Wednesday night teaching. We believe revelation causes transformation. We do believe knowledge gives you a degree and a dimension of power. We do feel like whatever area you're ignorant in, you suffer in. And with that being the case, we take times like this at, at Thrive 
because we believe there are people in this. In, uh, and uh, if you level three in the chat, if you know what that means, if you level three, just put level three in the chat. All right. Um, but we just believe that there are people who want to do more than just survive. There are people who want to thrive. The John 10, 10 life, the life Jesus came to give is a life that I believe can be described by the word thrive. It literally can, man. It can be described by the word thrive. So um, there are those of us who say, man, I want that. Now, I'm getting ready to say something. I don't know if y'all can handle this. Um, if, you, if, if you just want me to tell it like it is, just put that in the chat. Just say, tell it like it is. If you want me to just tell it like it is, put that, put that in the chat. Just say, tell it like it is. Okay. Let me, let, me, let me offer a disclaimer. Heaven is important. So I'm not saying heaven is important. This is what I am saying, though. In many spaces, followers of Jesus are so obsessed with getting to heaven that they don't realize that part of Jesus's priority was to get heaven, the values of heaven, to earth. As a matter of fact, Jesus didn't even tell us in the Lord's prayer to pray. Uh, see, I'm messing you up already. Are y'all okay? He didn't even tell us in the Lord's prayer to pray to get to heaven. Because once I've received him as the leader of my life and the forgive of my sin, that my eternal destination is settled. So he didn't even tell us to pray for that. You know what he told us to pray for? Here it is. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. On earth as it is in heaven. So there's this obsession that many people are operating with on trying to get to heaven. When what Jesus is saying is, I am trying to get some of the values of heaven to earth. Thrive. And that's what, the, that's what these teachings are about, man. They for the serious, not the curious. And, um, and so we teach series on these Wednesday nights and, or whenever you choose to watch it. We teach series because we believe the way you learn is through repetition. It's just the way that we learn. So we want to take a subject and unpack it. And all of the subjects that we teach are subjects that we believe will help you thrive. So in today's teaching, I'm starting a series of teachings on handling heartbreak. And um, I really want to begin, I typically don't do thrive like this, but I want to begin, I just want to read a part of a psalm of David so this is David a man after God's own heart and uh, we get almost like some insight into his journal and in Psalms 55 verse 12 this is what he says David says if an enemy were insulting me see some I just felt this when I say handling heartbreak somebody need to um listen to me somebody need to send this to somebody because I'm getting ready to show you in a minute that you don't just have heartbreak when you're broken up with. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I don't even know if I'm going to talk about breakups in this series. Right? So when, when most people hear heartbreaks, they think breakups. So then breakups become the only time they pay attention to their heart. Not knowing that your heart can be broken when you're not going through a breakup. Let me prove it to you. Let me prove it to you. Let me prove it to you. David says, Psalms 55, 12, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend. Watch this. 
with whom I once enjoy sweet fellowship at the house of God. Wait a minute. So I, I want you to I want you to I want you to hear what he's saying here. As we walked about among the worshipers. I'm going to read that last one again. I'm going to read verse 14 again. As we walked with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God, as we walked about among the worshipers. So let me kind of let, let me <laughs> let me set some expectations here. Let me set some expectations here. Because we're going to be talking about handling heartbreak in a number of different contexts through this series. Tonight, I want you to see where we're starting because you have a man after God's own heart who is dealing with a degree and a dimension of heartbreak. And this heartbreak did not come from an enemy. It came from a friend. Listen to what he said. He said, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. What is he saying? He's saying, I expect people that I have antagonistic like relationships with to be people who are behaving in ways that are not in my best interest. He say, I, I, so he says, so I, I'm not wounded by that as much because I don't have an expectation of them to behave differently. Come on. I know their nature. Write this down for my note takers. And when you know the nature of a thing, its behavior becomes predictable. Which is why some of us need to be, and I'm going to keep screaming this until I can't scream it anymore. We need to be more attentive so we can be more discerning. Somebody put in the chat, pay attention. Yeah, we need to, <coughs> watch this. The prerequisite for discernment is, in, is attention. There are people who say, I want discernment, which is the ability to make, recognize patterns and make your adjustments accordingly, right? Uh, but there cannot be the ability to recognize patterns and make your adjustments accordingly without attention. And attention very often requires intentionality. Gosh, not paranoia, but intentionality. A person making a decision that I am not, watch this, I am not going to reach my redemptive potential if I'm operating with naivety. I can't be naive. What's a word the Bible uses to describe those that are naive? Simple-minded. Simple-minded. So David says, because I understand the nature of my enemies, their behavior is predictable. So it's easy Er, not always easy, but it's easier for me to endure some of the issues I'm enduring with an enemy because I expect that. He says, but this happened. So David is articulating, watch this, some betrayal he's experienced. I don't know if, I don't know if y'all can handle where we get ready to go. I really don't, but it's Thrive. So we go there. So we go in there anyway. Here it is. Here it is. David is, watch this. David is articulating a degree of betrayal, betrayal that he's experienced by a companion and a close friend and someone he worshiped with. Come on in here. Come on in here. What did he say in verse 14? He said, I enjoy sweet fellowship at the house of God. As we, he says, we, we fellowship together at God's house. And so he says, I am emotionally impacted in a different kind of way. Not just because of what was done, but because of who did it. Because he's saying, I expected you to have a value system that would restrain you in such a way that even if you chose to betray someone, you wouldn't betray me. Okay. Uh, are y'all okay? 
Are y'all okay? He is articulating. <laughs> He's articulating heartbreak from someone he is not only close with, but someone he worships with. So come on, everybody breathe deep because we got to go there. This is going to be tough, guys. This is going to be tough, but we're going to get better and we're going to thrive and we're going to heal and we're going to evolve because if you're going to thrive, you're going to have to handle heartbreak. What am I doing? I am not articulating what David said in an attempt to make a cynical or paranoid. This should not lead you to paranoia. God did not give us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. I am not saying be paranoid. Paranoia is not of God. The Bible says perfect love cast out fear. When you know you are loved perfectly, maturely by the Father, the revelation of that love creates the eviction of fear because you begin to say things like and think in ways like, he loved me too much to let me go out like this. Somebody ought to put some fire in the chat right there. Perfect love cast out fear. He loves me too much to let me go out like this. So I'm not saying be paranoid. I'm not saying be cynical, but I am articulating what David has shared with us so that we can be wise because I want your expectations grounded in reality because I need you to see that if heartbreak can come to David from someone who's in the house of God, then heartbreak, ladies and gentlemen, can certainly come from someone that's in your house or in another house. So what am I trying to do here? I am trying, watch this. <laughs> I am trying to get us to ground our expectations in reality because I want you to know heartbreak is inevitable. See? Now I, I want you to I, no, I'm, I want you to sit with that for a minute. Because I meant that. I, I don't need to say it a different way. I'm not gonna try to say it a different way. I'm saying heartbreak is inevitable. Am I saying that 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 um, that we can do nothing about heartbreak? No, that's not um, that's not what I'm saying, which is why I said paying attention and discernment is important because you're able to inspect fruit, see what kind of tree that that is. And you're able to set boundaries emotionally or physically or whatever type of boundaries you have to set to minimize the impact of people's imperfections on you. So, yes, there are certain things that we can do to prevent some heartbreak. But write this down. There is nothing you can do to prevent all heartbreak. Gosh. So then, since I can't avoid it, I need to learn how to overcome it. And this is what we, this is, come on, this is the, this is the way those of us who are following the person, the practices, and the principles of Jesus. This is the way, family, we need to think. We need to think that I don't have to avoid everything to overcome everything. We need to realize and recognize that God doesn't have to, watch this, cause me to avoid it in order for me to overcome it. That even the gospel, the gospel is not a gospel of avoidance. The gospel is a gospel of overcoming. It is, are there certain things we avoid? Yes. We see examples of this in the book of Exodus with the incident that um, that is the root of the inspiration for the feast of Passover when the death angel passes over the houses that have blood on the doorpost. That's an example of exemption and exception. Yes. But I am telling you, there are also instances where God gives. So, so there are instances where God gives victory through avoidance. And then there are issues, instances in the Bible where God gives victory by overcoming. Either way, you get the victory. So if you avoid, you win. 
But if you don't avoid and you overcome, you still winning. All I do is win. Somebody put that in the chat. All I do is win. And you'd be amazed at how many people's belief in their ability to win is tied and tethered to um, them avoiding something. They think they got to avoid. I'm telling you not so. And some of you are in the midst of adversity right now. You're in the midst of unexpected inconveniences. You're in the midst of heartbreak. And we're going to we're going to walk you through some of this. You're You're in the midst of heartbreak. And I am telling you that even in the midst of this and many of us we will be questioning God. It may not seem just. It may not seem fair. I am telling you that like the Hebrew boys, you may go in the fiery furnace, but you're going to win like Daniel. You may go in the lion's den but you're still going to come out like Paul and Silas. You may find yourself in a emotional or, or, or a spiritual prison. But like Paul and Silas, you're going to get out like Jesus. You may find yourself in a proverbial tomb. You may feel like you're locked in and locked out, but in three days you're going to get up. So, when I say heartbreak, heartbreak is inevitable. I'm not saying that to push you to a state of pity. I'm saying that to push you to a place of preparation. And I'm going to tell you something. And I'm going to keep reiterating this. There are some things you can do to prevent some heartbreak. But there is nothing you can do to prevent all heartbreak. Darius, I need you to prove that to me just a little bit more. Okay, Jesus is, is, I think, the perfect example. He's a perfect man. What does that mean? As a perfect man, he does everything perfectly. So the way he manages every situation is perfect. The way he treats his friends, his disciples, is perfect. He always feels what should be felt. He always says what should be said. His response to every situation was the perfect response. So you had a perfect man who sees perfectly, feels perfectly, knows perfectly, always responds perfectly, and that man still got betrayed. Judas. So if a perfect man who sees perfectly, feels perfectly, invests perfectly, speaks perfectly, gets betrayed watch this and not only gets betrayed but recognizes that that betrayal is inevitable there's where you get that well Jesus had something he had like a last supper pre-death with his disciples right and they all go to this room and they're having this last supper and Jesus uh, at the table says hey somebody here is going to betray me that's a completely different lesson You know, you got to know who's at your table. Jesus said, somebody here is going to betray me. And then. um, They like, who is it? (laughs) And Jesus tell them Judas. And then Jesus looks at Judas and says, whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. So he knew he was about to be betrayed. Yet look at me. Listen to me, please. Yet. He didn't try to talk the betrayer out of it because he knew he couldn't. Your generosity never changes the character of a betrayer. Y'all, I ain't even, I ain't even on my notes. <laughs> I'm not even on my nose. But heartbreak, guys, is inevitable. Some of you are dealing with heartbreak or have dealt with heartbreak parentally. Some of you dealt with well, dealt with heartbreak romantically in a romantic relationship. Um, 
Some of you have dealt with heartbreak because of your own children. Some of you have dealt with heartbreak at work. Some of you, like David, have dealt with heartbreak at church. Some of you dealt with heartbreak from friends. At some point, you are going to be adversely impacted by somebody else's imperfections. And you have to make a decision on how you're going to handle that because you're not always going to be able to avoid it. And here's the thing. Let's be honest now. Come on. Let's talk. We'll, let's, let's get healed through this series, guys. Let's not just get inspired or informed, but let's get healed through these series. Watch this. And you can't get healed if you won't be real. And if most of us are real, we are just intuitively handling heartbreak. We don't have biblical, we don't have a, a philosophy to handle heartbreak that's informed by the scriptures. When you really think about it, it's like, how do you handle heartbreak and where did you get that from? I think for many of us, there are some things that we, uh, you know, that, you know, some scriptures and things of that nature that we would quote. You know, we say some things like, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not going to render evil for evil. Uh, I'm going to be angry, but I'm not going to allow my anger to to create a sinful response. Like so there, you know, we, we probably know a scripture or two. But if I were to like, hey, if I were to like sit us down and be like, hey, like. What's your plan for handling heartbreak? <laughs> Woo. What's your plan for that? Many of us don't have one. And we, we must be prepared to handle it because watch this. Satan is banking on you not having a plan. Yep. Dr. Dears, how can you say this? Write this down. Write this down. This is how I can say this. Because whatever God creates, Satan wants to corrupt. Whatever God creates, Satan wants to corrupt. Satan is not a creator. He's a corrupter. He's not a creator. He's a clone. And so God created your heart, which is a part of your soul, mind, will, emotions, imaginations, and affection. So God created your heart, and he knows that the quality of your life is determined by the condition of your heart. Listen, you can succeed without a healthy heart. You just can't thrive. And this right here, this teaching, we're about thriving. I'm going to say that again. You can't, some of y'all are not sharing this. And I'm telling you, there are people in your relational circle that need this. Some of you know somebody's going, and, now, and, and, and like I said, I might not even talk about heartbreak, but some of you know somebody right now whose child has broken their heart. Their parents have broken their heart. They, their sibling rivalry, like Cain and Abel. There's workplace jealousy, like what Daniel had to deal with. Come on. Like, you, you know that they, somebody they in love with has betrayed their trust. Like, you know somebody that's going through this. And most of the time, what we give people in the midst of heartbreak is encouragement. Do they need encouragement? Yes. But, but I need more than encouragement. I need instruction. Come on here. When I'm, if somebody cut me and I'm bleeding, I need somebody to encourage me to say, yeah, you're going to be okay. Uh, you can do this, Darius. Hold on. But I also, at some point, need some instruction to stop the bleeding. And many times we're resorting to tact. We mean well. But we're resorting to tactics and principle. that are normal and common, but not effective. Somebody hurt, come on, let's go get drunk. Somebody hurt, come on, let's go get, uh, let's go, let's, let's go party, let's take your mind off of it. 
somebody in a relationship they get their heart broken go find somebody else they don't even really like like that is this too real I don't know if this well it's thrive so the only way we're going to thrive is is if we're honest and authentic <laughs> like rebound and go with somebody they don't even like to try to get their mind off the person that they really like and it don't even work I'm gonna leave it at that, boy. If, if this was, <laughs> if I was in, a, <laughs> if I was in a different setting, we would really get a little real there. So when we really think about it, we mean well, but it is, but it's like, what's the pain plan? So I'm gonna say something I said earlier one more time. Whatever God creates, Satan wants to corrupt. God created your heart. He could have made you without emotions. But if he did that, you wouldn't be in his image and likeness. Because although the terms are used, what we would call anthropomorphically, um, there are terms that the Bible uses to, that are like emotional terms to describe God. Because your emotion gives you capacity, some capacity that logic doesn't give you. It gives you intuition that logic doesn't give you. It gives you connectivity that logic doesn't give you. It gives you pleasure that you can't get just with logic alone. God knew in order for you to experience and me to experience life the way he intended, he had to give us more than a brain. He had to give us a heart. We needed more than logic and intellect. We needed emotion. And this is a completely different lesson. And actually, studies are showing now, at least studies conducted in the area and arena of emotional intelligence, that it is, it's a person's EQ, not IQ, that's actually a greater predictor of a person's success. Woo! Because, see, their IQ may increase a person's acumen and capacity, awareness of something that they need to do. But it is EQ that actually equips you to do it. See, see, some, some of our problem right here, some of our problems is not, at least in my life, there have been times where my problems were not IQ. It wasn't that I didn't know. It was EQ. It was, for whatever reason, I couldn't do it. If you have been in a situation like that, just put me too in the chat. Just put me too. Me too. And I know here's the saying. Here, here's the saying, guys. Here's the saying. Here's the saying. Here's the saying. Time heals all wounds. No, it doesn't. Somebody write this down. Time takes the pain away. It doesn't take the wound away. <laughs> Gosh, y'all ain't even on my notes here. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Time takes the pain away. It doesn't take the wound away. I tell this story very often about my father. His right pinky finger is like this. He can't extend the finger. So his, his right pinky finger only extends this far. Because when I was a teenager, we were playing basketball in the backyard, and I tried to get a rebound. I came down on his finger. Boom, I broke his, broke his finger. I heard it pop. So my dad, old school, he never went to the doctor to get it um, fixed, Right? And so it grew back, but it grew back wrong. Here's the issue, guys. His finger don't hurt no more. His finger no longer hurts. So did, so time took the pain away. But time didn't fix the brokenness. As a matter of fact, 
when he went to look into getting it fixed, the doctor said, I can fix it, but I have to break it again because it grew back, but it grew back together wrong. And this is the way some of our hearts look. They not hurting. There's something that, so my father hurt his finger proverbially, his, his finger literally uh, playing basketball. Well, some of us have been hurt in relationships, parental relationships. I'm going to teach you what to do when you're dealing with heartbreak parentally, when something your parents did that they shouldn't have done or didn't do that they should have did. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about how to handle heartbreak with children. When you have thrown your heart into them and raised them and guided them and sacrificed for them, and like the father of the prodigal son, you got multiple children in the same house that got the same teaching, the same kind of love, the same kind of uh, guidance, and they take two different paths, and you are confused and like, how in the world did this just happen? I'm going to teach you how to handle that. I'm going to teach you, I'll teach you what to do. We might talk a little bit about breakups, but I'm going to teach you what to do, like in the context of a marriage, that when you took your vows seriously and you meant every word of them, and even when it was inconvenient and uncomfortable, you were faithful to those vows, and then there were people maybe that you would, that, that were not, and, and it, 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 it breaks your heart in a different kind of way. See, you can go through all of that and it may not hurt anymore. But that doesn't mean the heart's not like this. Can my dad use this finger? Yes. Can he use his the way I can use mine? No. So there is some functionality, but there's not full functionality. Because it grew back, and it grew back wrong. Because that's what happens, family, when it comes to heartbreak. Whatever God creates, he created our heart, Satan wants to corrupt. Because you can succeed. The quality of your life is determined by the condition of your heart. You can succeed. Listen to me. You can succeed without a whole heart. You just can't thrive without one. So when I say succeed, it means that you can have success in some areas. Like you can have success financially without a whole heart. You can have success professionally without a whole heart. This is, you can have success in ministry. Like, I'm, I mean, I don't know if you can have success from God's perspective in ministry because I think God's metrics and our metrics aren't always the same. Like, <laughs> so that's, that's a completely different, uh, I think God, does the God count people? Of course God count. Every number is a name. Every name represents a story in a person. Every story in person matters to God. So there's a whole book of the Bible called Numbers. So do numbers matter to God? Yes. But God is not just counting people. He's weighing them. He's not just looking at how many people are following me. He's looking at how much of me is actually in these people. How much Shekinah, Kabod, how much weightiness, how much of my presence is in them? How much do they weigh? Are they full of themselves or are they full of me? So you can have all of that, but not be thriving. And if all you got is success in some of those areas, I don't care how much money you made. I don't care how successful you are. It matters not how much notoriety you got. If all you got is external success and you do not have internal fulfillment, you are settling. I, I say this a lot uh, when I'm speaking in entrepreneurial spaces. Um, if all you got is some money, you settling. <laughs> I got, all you got now is money important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and money's not the most important thing. It affects every, almost everything that's important. But uh, if all you got, that you're settling. So let me say this again. Whatever 
God creates, Satan wants to corrupt. This is so important that one of the wisest men to ever live is a man named Solomon. And this is what Solomon said. And um, I can't say this scripture enough. This is what Solomon says. He says, guard your heart. I'm going to teach you how to do, guys, listen, I'm just laying foundation here, okay? I got to lay, I'm just like laying some foundation here. And we're going to get very tactical and practical in the coming weeks. But he says, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. Meaning every aspect of my life is impacted by what's going on with my heart. And I know you survived and I know you winning and I know the devil couldn't stop you and I know it didn't block you and I know the divorce didn't break you and I know the jealousy couldn't take, you know, couldn't take your success. I know you won anyway. My question is, does that heart look like this, though? What does that heart look like? Why is this important? All right, let me get to my notes here and let's wrap up. Why is this important? <clears throat> this is important because God wants us to have whole hearts for three reasons. Number one, he wants us to have whole hearts for our pleasure. Now, I'm going to say this. We should not make an idol out of pleasure. We should not make an idol out of comfort. But I'm standing 10 toes down. Well, I'm sitting right now. But I'm standing 10 toes down um, that the scriptures, on, on my conviction at least, that the scriptures are clear that God delights in the pleasure of his people. Joy, pleasure, peace, pleasure. God recognizes that there's a degree of internal fulfillment that is only possible with a heart that's not jaded, a heart that's not cynical, a heart that's not paranoid. Now, why, why is this pleasure or let's use the word joy? Why is this important? Now, here's the book now. Here's the Bible. Here's the Bible. Here's the Bible. Here's the Bible. Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Jesus said, I've spoken this to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. So he is articulating his intention that we have full joy. He said, I want, he said, I want your joy to be full. My God. He said, I want it to be full full watch this but you don't get full joy just by wanting full joy because I want full joy I've always wanted full joy but you don't get full joy by wanting full joy you get full joy by doing the things that give you full joy and protecting yourself from the things that rob your joy Paul puts it this way, uh, joy unspeakable and, and full of glory. It's Paul or Peter, I'm confused now. Joy inexpressible and full of glory. So what? It's a type of joy that glorifies God. So God's like, I want you to have whole hearts so you can have full joy because I'm glorified in your joy. Hi, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that people are able to see my goodness through your joy. Come on here. That, <laughs> that God's like, I want you to have this whole heart so that you have full joy. So that when people are interacting with you and making observations about you, they see that you have something that makes you rich where they poor. 
Come on here. Full joy. He says, I want to be glorified. He says, if you're despondent and in despair and defeated and unenthusiastic and downcast, that's not attractive. It's not alluring. It's not salt of the earth. It's not light of the world. It, it, it doesn't accurately portray, come on, uh, that the, 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 the evidence of God's working on the heart of an individual. It's like, yeah, come follow me as I follow Christ so you can be downcast, in despair, upset. No, the devil is a liar. God is glorified in my joy. So that's why he wants us to have a whole heart. Number one, our pleasure. Number two, he wants us to have a whole heart, which means we got to properly manage heartbreak. Number two, because of our purpose. Number one, our pleasure. Number two, our purpose. Darius, what do you mean by that? Psalm 78, 72 says, and David shepherded Israel with the integrity of his heart and the skillfulness of his hands. So this, ladies and gentlemen, reveals to us two aspects uh, or two areas that God emphasizes that we've got to lean into if we want to effectively carry out what we've been born to do. Heart and hands. Heart and hands. Integrity of his heart, skillfulness of his hands. So he was skilled at a thing. That's a completely different lesson. And we, we have to talk about that. The saints need to understand the importance of skill. I know we're spiritual, but we need to understand the importance of skill. We cannot accomplish our assignment to actually change the world if we don't take skill seriously. We have been called to be missionaries in the marketplace. We have been called, we have been called now, come on, my, come on, I want you to catch this. We have been called to be Daniels and Nehemiahs and Josephs that are invading culture invading some of the seven sectors and seven mountains and we're supposed to be delivering value in the marketplace that's solving people's problems and helping people reach a goal come on and when we do that like Daniel we get we get positioned in places of influence where we can now influence that sector for the common good and now we also have the ability to exercise spiritual influence on other people because they see this person's skilled, they're credible, they're good at what they do, yet they got some joy on the inside that's showing on the outside. Yet they got a value system that they don't sneak and, and connive and lie and exploit and steal. So that's a completely different lesson. I need, to, I need to do a lesson on that. Skills. <laughs> I know we're spiritual, but skills. Lord, I don't want to get too much into this. Too many times, saints recognize spiritual gifts or natural abilities, talents, but they don't develop them so that they become a skill. So that you can be gifted at something and not skilled in it. And the, one of the greatest enemies to some people's skill development is their previous success. That's the reason some people can't get better because they, can't, they won't get better in their present because things have went well for them in their past. I see this with speakers all the time. I'm running a program now called Purpose and Profit Academy, and I am um, helping people. There are about eight, eight avenues that I'm teaching people to utilize to carry out an aspect of their purpose, to serve other people, and also create a stream of income uh, back into them that they can use to free themselves up to focus more on their purpose or to fund things that are part of their purpose that they're passionate about so that we're not always begging and asking other people to fund God's work. And um, 
one of the things I say a lot in that program, and I'm going to keep saying it, and I hope, the, I hope the people in that program are getting it, is like, I'm giving you the strategies in that program, but none of the strategies work without skill. None of them work without skill. I'm going to create a course. It's not going to be good if you don't speak well. I'm going to create a podcast. not going to be good if you don't speak well. I'm going to run a culture group. It's not going to be good if you don't speak well. I'm going to write a book. It's not going to be good if you don't write well. I don't even know why I got all on this. Skill. And previous success, I mean, I remember this was years ago, a long time ago. I remember one time years ago, uh, I had, there was this pastor that had reached out to me. I was think I was first getting started in ministry. This person was experiencing some plateaus and church wasn't growing, et cetera. And this is way back in the day. I don't, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't a drop box. And uh, I don't think YouTube was popping like that. And uh, I told the guy, I was like, yo, send me a CD. So we had CDs. I'm that old. <laughs> we had CDs and CD players. I said, "Send me a CD. Let me hear you. You, you, you know, let me hear you speak." And he was like, "Oh no, 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 no! I don't need to send a D- I, CD. I know it's not my preaching." I said, oh, "I said right then, okay, I can't help him. Right then, I said I can't, I can't help him. Because he's operating with an assumption that he's better at something than he actually is. And he's assuming that if I fix everything else, I won't have to fix this in the skill area. Anyway, here's the point. Because I got one more point and then we're done. David shepherded Israel, their skill, right? Hands skillfulness of his hands but also integrity of his heart his heart purpose requires more than your hands it requires your heart and what the enemy wants to do the enemy wants to use the pain of your past to make your heart not fully functional so that when it comes to your purpose you don't throw your heart in it There are some of you, I feel this prophetically, some of you right now that are even watching this, and as I'm speaking, you're you're experiencing an epiphany. Right at this moment, you're experiencing an epiphany because you're seeing that you're so gifted that you can use your hands and withhold your heart, and people don't even know the difference. You do what you do so well that people don't even recognize your heart's not in it. And so you're not fully throwing your heart into some people in your present because of what some other people did in your past. But you're so gifted, those people don't know the difference. I'm telling you, God does. And God's like, I have called, created, and commissioned you to throw your heart into what I've called you to do. My heart is in Thrive. I'm not just throwing words out. My heart is in this. Because only the heart can reach the heart. And many of us, I've been there, guys. I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not immune from this. I've been there. And many of us have been wounded. We've been betrayed in our past. And in the midst of our pain, we made vows. And we made vows regarding what we would never do. I'll never help anybody else like that again. I'll never do this and that again. And when we make those vows, you literally made a vow to pain not just a vow in pain you made a vow to pain and and when you make a vow like that to pain you're rejecting the leadership and the lordship of Jesus in that area of your life in essence what you're saying is 
I've already made a decision what it's going to be like going forward. So, God, there's no use in you telling me any different. And so God's like, OK, if you're not going to listen, I'm not going to speak. But my silence is not my endorsement. Just because I'm not saying anything about it don't mean I'm cool with it. Are y'all OK? If you're not OK, just say, <laughs> just say I'm not OK. <laughs> If you're not okay, let me see. If you're not okay, just say I'm 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 not okay. <laughs> I'm not okay. You can't say I'm living, loving, and leading like Jesus and not throw your heart into it. Gosh, I'm out of time. I I I shared something recently on one of one of the social media platforms where I was um, I had this moment where I felt like God kind of gave me some direction for my life in an area and he was just like you know Darius you know I asked myself one time I was like man am I too generous I, I literally I said like, is my generosity creating entitlement and I do think you can be yeah irresponsibly generous when you're indiscriminate but I was like man is my generosity creating entitlement and um, because I don't want to do that. And um, I was like, maybe I need to be less generous. And the Holy Spirit said to me, no, Darius, you don't need to be less generous. You need to be more strategic. Be generous, but be more strategic in your generosity. Be more discerning. Be more wise. And so we we can accomplish you you can do good you can help a lot of people you can get by you can fool people but you cannot accomplish what God has called for you to do you can't make the type of impact he wants you to make without um I need my moderators get the uh get the the, the bots out my chat tender hot uh this ain't the place unless you want Jesus we're going to give you some of this good Holy Ghost. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me get to my final point, but hopefully I'm making my point here. Your, pl- your purpose, require, it requires your heart, man. And then, and then finally, last but not least, uh, you're prospering. You're prospering. And when I say prospering, it could be prospering in, in terms of your fulfillment, it could be prospering in terms of your finances. It could be prospering in terms of your faith. That is going to be connected to your ability and your willingness to have a whole heart. Because part of your prospering is connected to people. I want to I I read you something. Not all of your prospering, but part of your prospering is connected to people. I'm going to read you something. This is Paul's letter to believers in Ephesus, okay? This is Paul's letter to believers in Ephesus, and this is um, Ephesians chapter number three. Um, I I think I memorized, when I first started reading the Bible, I was like um, 15, I think, 14, 15. I think I was like a sophomore, um, um, sophomore in high school. And I started reading it in the King James. And so that's the way I kind of uh, memorized the Bible. And so sometimes when I'm looking at it in these other versions, it's like, nah, that, that ain't, I, I wanted to say it like I, like I wanted to say it. So, excuse me, not Ephesians 3, Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, look at uh, verse 18 here. Um, Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your, your heart, gosh, I ain't got time. Because when your heart is hurt, your eyes are off. You got eyes here and you got eyes here. Come on here. These eyes, eyes of your heart. But here, he says, I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance 
in his holy people. Wait a minute. So Paul's saying, I'm praying that you get a revelation, an epiphany. Like, so he's like, he said, I'm not praying that you cognitively understand. Because there's a lot of stuff we cognitively understand that, that our heart doesn't embrace, right? I mentioned this in a message recently. I was like, yo, I am fully convinced now that I'm loved by God. But I understood that cognitively for years. It just took me a minute to embrace that practically, emotionally. But, but here, here's the point, family. He says, I pray that you get a revelation in your heart to the hope to which God's called you and the riches of your, his inheritance. There's an inheritance that he has for you, but he has put it in some people. So there's some stuff that God has for me that's in you. The treasure is in an earthen vessel, but the treasure in you is not for you. The treasure in me is not for me. God has given me a teaching gift. That's not for me. That's for the body. God's given me a leadership gift. That's not for me. That's for the body. So there, so me utilizing, come on, my gifts can cause other people to prosper in their faith, to prosper in their finances, to prosper in the area of fulfillment. But when your heart is jaded, you will end up trying to protect yourself from the people God has sent to prosper you. I got to quit right there. Let me just close this down right here because we out of time. I said when the heart has not handled heartbreak in the past properly, you will find yourself trying to protect yourself from people that God has sent to prosper you. Isn't that something? We can have experiences in our past where we don't protect ourselves from the wrong people that, so, that leave us so jaded, we end up trying to protect ourselves from the, from the right people. <laughs> it's like, no, you need to protect yourself from the wrong people so you can embrace and receive the right people. And that can only happen when I learn biblical principles for handling heartbreak it's the only way I can thrive because if, if I don't know how to handle heartbreak it means my ability or lack thereof to thrive is going to be dictated and determined by what somebody else does and doesn't do to me I can't let that determine if I I can't stop what you do to me I can't stop what you say about me I can't I can't stop I can't control that but I can't have my thriving dependent upon that I can't give somebody else power God didn't give them We can't thrive without it. And throughout this series, practically, we're going to teach you how to walk through some of this. How to walk through it in family, how to walk through it in church, how to walk through it in, in the workplace. We believe in God's going to meet us in an incredible way. Man, drop some fire in this chat. We just laid some foundation today. I know this was, I know I'm going a little bit, I'm talking a little spicy with this because I, I know this is just an area well, the body needs assistance and the body needs help and the body needs to thrive. And um, man, I'm really excited about it. Um, I want to invite you really quick uh, to be a part of something. We are really excited about this. I have at this point less than 100 seats available, but I'm doing this live event November the 4th and 5th, um, 2022. And I'm doing it at the Change Complex uh, in Duluth, Georgia. And it is a live event called Thrive 22. That's what it's called. It's two days, guys, of um, just, I believe it's, I don't know of any other event out there where you can go to one place and get spiritual development, emotional development, relational development, professional development, all in the same place. Like, I have to go to different places to get different things. Like, I had to go to church to get stuff spiritually. Then I had to go into the success industry to help me develop myself personally. Then I had to get in masterminds to develop myself professionally. Then I had to go to 
uh, counselors to develop myself emotionally. Y'all see, it's like uh, I'm, I had to be all over the place. Well, the kingdom is not this or that, it's this and that. And part of my calling is not just to teach it, but to live and to try to model that, hey, you, you can win in all the areas that matter. Am I perfect in those areas? No. But do I believe I've tapped into something to help people thrive in those areas? Yes. Married 21 years. Um, been working on my soul health for close to a decade. Um, an entrepreneur. Priest and king. King and king maker in the marketplace. Raising up entrepreneurs. So I don't know where you can go and get all of that in one place. And we not putting faces on the flyer. We not saying who's who, who's going to be there. But if you want the best spiritual, personal, professional, business development event all in one place with kingdom people two days with me, I only, and so like, you know, people, we don't lie in our marketing. We don't lie. You ain't got to lie, Craig. We don't lie in our marketing. When I say I got less than 100 seats, I got less than 100 seats left because I hadn't been promoting this because it was going to be only for people that are in some of my programs. So Purpose and Profit Academy is coming. Some people in Daniel's Den are coming. My transformational speaking and coaching uh, mentees are coming. Um, I've trained and certified over 150 coaches and speakers this year alone. So some of them are coming. People in my inner circle are coming. I'm speaking that many of you one day are going to be in my inner circle. Some of my people in the inner circle are coming. So with just the people from those programs alone that are coming, my building is almost full. So my team was like, open it up for a few people in general. So once our seats are gone, our seats are gone, you can go to thrive, the number 22.live. T-H-R-I-V-E, the number is 22, dot L-I-V-E. And um, you can find out information and um, you can decide if you want to be there or not. But I did want to invite you to be a part of that. I love to meet some of you in person. If not, you can't do it this year. Uh, maybe next year if the seats are available. All right? Love you guys so much. Hey, thank you in advance for your generosity. They're going to put the, that lower third back on the screen one more time for you. Thank you for sowing into the field that you're harvesting from. I don't care who teaches what. Let God be true and every man be a liar. The Bible is right. And the Bible says the liberal or the generous soul shall be made fat. God rewards and honors generosity. Paul says, he who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. You know, so I, I, you know, I, think that's, I think that's important. Just because some people in the body of Christ have a revelation that they need to correct their teaching doesn't mean everybody in the body of Christ needs to correct their teaching. That means that person needs to correct, or those people who are having those revelations, they need to correct their teaching. It doesn't mean everybody in the body needs to correct their teaching because everybody in the body wasn't teaching what they were teaching before they got the revelation that they need to correct their teaching. So that's not a shot or a low blow or a shade at anybody. Um, I don't do that. I'm just speaking generally. This is a biblical principle. I think the enemy doesn't want people. I think that's why the enemy uses weird stuff and all types of shenanigans and games to, to get us to not be generous. He wants people adverse to this, but uh, we need to make a decision. I'm not going to avoid something just because somebody abused it. We're not going to correct wrong teaching with non-teaching. We're going to correct wrong teaching with right teaching. And that is, I don't care what you're doing in life, you can till the ground, you can plant the seed, only God can make it rain. And, um, so thank you in advance, man, for your generosity. All right, man, I'm praying blessings on you this week. I look forward to seeing you next week for part two. Take care. Hey, listen, thank you for watching Thrive. I want you to make sure you subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of our teachings. And remember, you can watch me live at Thrive every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Take care. I'll see you soon.